Authors Over 50, Writing in Life's Sweetest Third. Authors Over 50's weekly podcast celebrates writers and their journeys to publication. Writing after 50 is a whole story on its own, so let's skip to Life's Sweetest Third and talk with authors about their journey from pen to publish. Welcome, I'm Julia Daly, your host, and I invite you to listen to interviews with writers who've achieved their goal of publishing a book just later in life. We've seen award lists for under 30 or under 40, but I've yet to see lists for those who've achieved a significant milestone of their own, launching a new career and publishing their first book after the age of 50. We will hear about these authors' inspirations, struggles, strategies, and the smell of that first book. These writers' journeys inspire me because I'm one of them. My guest today is the author of the domestic suspense novel, The Perfect Neighborhood, the young adult thriller, He'll Be Waiting, and the memoir, Sad Sacked, all published after the age of 50. Her work has appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, McSweeney's, and other outlets. She lives in New Jersey with her husband, three sons, and two cats, and spends most days microwaving the same cup of coffee and looking up synonyms. When she isn't writing, she's reading. Welcome to Authors Over 50, Liz Alterman. Thank you so much for having me, Julia. I'm thrilled to be here. Liz, our first question on Authors Over 50 is always, what took you so long to write your first book? Thanks for asking. That's such a good question. I think, you know, from the time I was little, I've always been an avid reader. And so it was always a dream of mine to write a book and to have it published as kind of the next step. But um, I think, you know, I began in earnest writing a book that is, um, I think, still in a straw bag in the back of my closet about, I would say, 20 years ago, when my oldest son was a baby, I would write during his nap time. And I guess just the enormity of it is kind of what discouraged me. So I got maybe 100 pages into it. And then I think he gave up napping and that self-doubt kind of took over. And so I just sort of shelved it for a while because it just seemed like such a monumental undertaking. And I got a little overwhelmed and intimidated. And so I think, um, but the older I got, I thought, you know what, you're not getting any younger. And if this is still a life dream, you know, there's no time like now. So you better just go for it. Well, Liz, you must have had several books written and in a drawer somewhere because by the time you published (laughs) one, you pretty much published three. Right. You know, I think it's funny when um, I think there's someone else who will say, um, you know, people will say you're an overnight success, but really it took me 14 years. So I would say, yes, I've been toiling away and it just sort of seemed that everything happened at once. So people will say like, wow, you did so much in a year or two, but really it's been about seven or eight years that I've been sort of cobbling together these manuscripts and accumulating rejections and hoping for the best. (laughs) sending things out into the world and waiting, waiting, waiting. Well, one of the reviews I saw compared your humor to Irma Bombeck. That's pretty high praise. That is. That's such a huge compliment. Yes, I was so grateful for for that because, um, you know, I think she was such an idol growing up. My mom was always quoting Irma. And um, to have that said is like the ultimate compliment. Have you always had such a great sense of humor or when did it manifest itself into your writing? Oh, thank you for asking. Um, You know, my husband and I went through a rather dark time a few years back when we lost our jobs within six weeks of each other. And I guess I think it was my grandmother who would often say, if I weren't laughing, I would be crying. And so I think, you know, I sort of adopted that attitude in this period of both of us being unemployed. And um, in the memoir I wrote, I say at one point we, I was sort of looking across the table at him. And I think it was the day that 
I was let go and he had been let go six weeks earlier. And I was thinking of that old line, um, I married you for better or worse, but not for lunch. And I realized we were just going to be staring at each other indefinitely. And it was winter in New Jersey. So, you know, not a lot of fun, not much to do other than job hunt. And again, accumulate more rejections and sort of worry about how we pay the mortgage. So along the way, there were sort of funny things that happened to us. Um, just I would go for a job interview and the interviewer would forget that I had something scheduled or, you know, just crazy things in the application process where they'd ask you to describe yourself in 160 characters and what's your favorite theme song or what would be your personal theme song. So, and we just felt like we're too old and tired for, and we need a job to, you know, keep our kids in sneakers and Cheerios and all of that. So I sort of, that kind of forced me to, um, it was like a sink or swim moment, either find something humorous and keep going, or I think we would have just really gone under. <laughs> well, once you knew you had to write your book, how did you proceed? Because it looks like you chose three different approaches and publishers and your latest book is being launched by Crooked Lane, which is distributed by Pingram uh, Random House. And it's one of the major publishing houses. So tell us more about your journey. Oh, thank you for asking. Well, I guess, you know, I was a freelance writer and I was given an assignment to interview a woman locally who had founded a writer's school. And one of the questions I asked her was, what's your most popular class? And she said, memoir writing. So many people feel that they have a story to tell and they just need a little support along the way. And so at the time I was thinking about writing a memoir about my experience with job loss. And so hearing her say that, I thought, you know what, I'd like to do something for myself and my writing, I'll do that. So I took this class and I workshopped it and it really held me accountable to keep writing, which is something I needed. Cause of course, you know, with all the streaming services and so much TV and, you know, so many distractions, I needed something to keep me honest. So I did that and I got an agent and she was lovely and she tried so hard to sell the memoir, but we bumped up against a lot of that, you know, you're not a celebrity, you're not famous, you don't have a platform why should anyone buy your book? And then what would kill me is I'd get other rejections where people would say, um, have you thought about just making this an essay? And I would say, I just wrote 90,000 words. No, you know, or like I had written essays, but no, I wanted this to be something bigger. So unfortunately we didn't get any bites. And um, at the time also the economy was doing well. So people would say, nobody wants to read about your unemployment story. So I kind of shelved it. And being a mom of teens, I love to see my kids reading. And so I thought, what could I write that they might be interested in? So that is sort of what led me to write a young adult thriller. And so I got another agent and we tried again. And, um, you know, people sent back kind, editors sent kind rejections, but nothing that was going to actually get it sold. So uh, I started looking on my own and I found an independent publisher, um, Willow River Press, um, which is an imprint of Between the Lines. And they were lovely and they have been wonderful to work with. And so they published, that came out last April. And that was really exciting to see, you know, something finally in print. And then I guess right around that time, a friend of mine had said, have you ever considered sending your memoir to Audible? They have a pitch portal. And I was not aware of that. So I sent my memoir. And about a month later, I got an email saying our editor read it and she'd love to talk to you about it. And I, I mean, it took me about eight rereads to believe that it wasn't a joke <laughs> after so much rejection. And so Audible bought the, uh, the memoir. And so that's an audio book. And then at the same time, I guess I had been working on The Perfect Neighborhood. And um, so Crooked Lane, I was able to submit directly to an editor there. And I had sent it around to a few places. And Legend Press in the UK was also interested. So luckily, I was able to sell it directly to both publishers, and which um, it was just a dream come true. And so it really, it feels like all of those years 
years of, you know, kind of writing and rewriting and accumulating rejections, you know, has finally sort of turned a corner. I mean, who knows what the future holds, but <laughs> it, uh, so to anyone who's out there toiling away, I would say, don't, don't ever get discouraged. And it doesn't matter how old you are because, you know, to see it in print is, is just magical. Well, it's so wonderful that we have so many options now and can go directly to publishers because so many of us, you know, fight the battle of searching for agents for, for so many years and you've had more than one. So how did you actually find your agents when you were, were looking for those? Oh, well, the first one was just sort of, um, unexpected too. I had put out, I guess, a tweet during one of the pit mad um, days. And it was, I guess, in December, many years ago. And this agent liked my tweet. And so I sent her a sample of the memoir and she wrote back rather quickly and said, um, please go ahead and send the rest of your manuscript. And again, I guess, you know, you have so much self-doubt that I, again, I was like, is this a scam? Is this a real person? You know, and of course she ended up, she was wonderful. And, but it was just unfortunate, I guess, timing or again, no one thought I was, I wasn't a real housewife in uh, <laughs> Bravo terms to sell it. And then um, my next agent, I just started querying and that was, uh, I was fortunate to attract an agent that way. But again, after many rejections or, you know, people and so much mixed feedback, um, you know, I didn't connect with the voice or I don't know how to break this out or the pacing wasn't right. So I feel like it's just, it's almost a numbers game of not getting discouraged and continuing to try. What about your writing routine? Are you able to write full time now on your your novels or do you still write uh, for other publications? Um, you know, it's sort of mixed. I had accepted a full time job last April and I was working in corporate communications. And once I started it, um, I really missed writing and I missed freelancing. And I guess I had just gotten out of the habit of sort of corporate America and all of the meetings and sort of that type of spending your day that way. And so I was laid off in February and, um, you know, of course, having been laid off before, I was <laughs> no stranger to it. So I sort of took it in stride. And um, within about an hour, I just felt such a sense of relief that I would be able to kind of get back to what I really loved. And so I've been working on a new manuscript. And so that layoff really gave me the time to focus on that. And then I've gone back to some freelancing assignments, which um, I feel like is a nice break when you hit those blocks in a manuscript, or you just think I need a little time for an idea to gel. So I've been fortunate to do that too. And as far as publicity and marketing books, you know, we're asked to write so many essays to send out there that I feel like we're all freelancers by the time we we get through all yeah. of that process. Uh, what what has worked for you as far as um, publicity and marketing of these books? Oh, that's a great question. And it's true. I feel like I'm, I'm always trying to come up with ideas that are tied to the books. Um, I did write a few when my memoir came out just about how to survive unemployment when your partner is unemployed as well. And um, I also wrote a piece about layoff anxiety, which it was kind of funny because I was writing saying in my new job, I fear that I'm going to be laid off again. And then about a month after it was published, I was. <laughs> so it's sort of almost like a self-fulfilling thing. And then um, right now with the launch of The Perfect Neighborhood, I'm working on the role, a piece for crimereads.com about the role of small town gossip in thrillers. So that's exciting. That's very interesting. How did you determine the plot for this this um, most recent novel? Well, it's funny. I woke up from a dream with the idea for the plot and I mentioned it to my husband and he said, oh, that's never going to work. And <laughs> so I kind of shelved it for a little while. But, you know, as I was washing dishes or doing some gardening or throwing in the laundry, it would just kind of, you know, the characters were kind of 
almost talking to me in my head. I know for non-writers, that sounds kind of strange. But so I waited months thinking another idea would come to me. And then one day I just sort of sat down and I thought, you know what, this is the only idea I have. If I want to go back to writing, I might as well give this one a shot. And I wrote about 6,000 words in one sitting. And I mean, they were fragmented and disjointed, but I looked when I was done, I felt like, wow, you, if you have this much to say without really trying, like you have to give this a shot. So that's when I started. And so I signed back up for classes at the same writing school where I had taken the memoir workshops and I began workshopping it. And uh, it was really wonderful because the other participants, one woman was writing sort of an auto fiction um, novel and another was working on a middle grade. So we were all working on different genres, but their feedback was so helpful and constructive that I think, um, you know, I thank them in the acknowledgements because I just don't, I don't think the book, I would have been as encouraged to continue without them. So it was really a great experience. Well, why don't you tell us a, a little synopsis of the book and then read a few paragraphs so that we can hear your tone and voice in the book. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, well, the plot, it starts off with, um, there's a woman who's a, a former model and actress, and she has sort of left town, this small affluent town in the middle of the night. And it's kind of all the neighbors are talking about until a five-year-old boy, Billy Barnes, goes missing on his walk home from kindergarten. And that sort of, you know, ca catches everyone up short thinking, how could something this terrible have happened in our lovely leafy suburb? And is it that we were focused too much on this other family, this couple, rather than, you know, was there a predator in our midst that we hadn't been aware of? So that's sort of the premise. And then I guess I'll, I'll start right from chapter one, if that works. Okay. Thursday, June 13th, Rachel. For the past two months, we spoke of little other than the Langleys. Did you hear? She's gone. No, it can't be true. If they can't make it work, none of us stands a chance. Allison and Christopher Langley? Oh, it's over. Totally. Someone saw him jogging with the dog. Just the two of them. That's a first. How long do you figure he'll be alone? Less than a minute. Look at him. I bet he won't even have to set up an online dating profile. How fast do you think he'll decide to move back to the city? That house has to have what? Four bedrooms at least? And so close to the elementary school. Let me know the second he decides to sell. I know a couple who'd kill for that location. On and on it went for weeks as May slipped into June. Nearly everyone within a three block radius of the Langley's well-maintained colonial whispered about them over hedges, in the parks and playgrounds, while walking their dogs and toddlers around the pond in the heart of our otherwise sleepy town. Some refused to believe it. The Langleys, no way. I'm sure she's just off filming another commercial, probably somewhere fabulous. I wonder what she's pushing this time, toothpaste? Rental cars, what a life. That might have seemed plausible if Mary Alice Foster's son, Phil, hadn't seen Allison hurry into an Uber at four in the morning without a suitcase. Can we trust Phil? No disrespect, I'm just saying. He hasn't seemed quite right since he got back. Oh, that's, that's great. That gets us right into the, into the suspense and makes us want to hear more. Oh, Julia, thank you. And I've heard so many people say that that um, premises come to them in their dreams. So it was interesting to hear that this one came to you. How long on average does it take you to write one of your books? Well, you know, it's interesting. I, I guess I tend to be rather impatient with myself, which is not a good thing because I think um, I like to think it's done. And then when I go back, I'll see all these things that I want to improve or revise. So I have to say, I worked on this novel probably from a little more than a year. And, but I will say it was during COVID. And so that gave me, I guess, a lot of free time since I wasn't going out or do it. I didn't have many distractions or social engagements. So 
I had about a dedicated year that I spent on it. And then um, when Crooked Lane made the offer on it, the editor came back with a few revisions. And so I worked on that maybe for about a month or so. And then even so, there was an idea that a friend who, um, she has an editing service and I had shared the novel with her and she was saying, you know, there's just this one part I feel could be a little bit more suspenseful. So before it went to print, but I didn't have any idea of how to really do that. But before it went to print, something came to me and I went back to my Crooked Lane editor and I said, would you mind if I just reworked this one chapter and if you don't like it, we'll go back to the original, but I just want it to be as suspenseful as possible. And so I sent it to her and she said, it's great. It works. We'll go with that one. So I have to say, I feel like I was still editing like until the midnight hour and I probably would still be editing if, if they let me. <laughs> but, um, I do like to say perfection is the enemy of done. So I think at some point you have to cut yourself off. I think that's so true. And and I read one time that even Eudora Welty said back when they had to send their hard copy manuscripts to New York, you know, that when she dropped it into the mailbox, she wanted to reach in after it and jerk it back out and work on it some more. So I think we're in very good company if we think our manuscripts are never completed. <laughs> yes, that makes me feel better to hear it. So I'm the one I'm working on now, I, I sort of had thought was done a couple of months ago, and now I still am tinkering with it. So you have to, I guess at some point, just hope that it's in as good a shape as possible and send it out into the world. And what is the one that you're working on? It's another domestic suspense. Uh, and this premise follows a young mom who moves into a new town and um, sort of gets a bad vibe from her neighbor. The neighbor is a little overbearing, a little intrusive. And then it's told from multiple points of view. So the other main point of view is a woman in Florida who is living in her mom's retirement community with her mom. And she has suffered a tragedy. And it turns out she is the former owner of the other main character's home. And it's sort of how their lives are going to converge at some point. Will it be published through uh, Crooked Lane as well? I don't know yet. I'm going to send it to them when it's in the best shape. Hopefully that'll be soon because <laughs> I know my family is sick of hearing me talk about it. <laughs> what do you think was the best money you ever spent as a writer? Oh, that's such a good question. I would say a few years ago, I treated myself to uh, a writer's retreat in Reconati, Italy. It's um, the Leopardi Writing Conference. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think it's hard as, as a writer and a parent to sort of, you know, somebody could always use your attention. So to carve out time and space for yourself, you know, at some points like, it's so important, but it can also feel kind of selfish. Um, and I don't know about you, but I feel like I'm never more in demand or no one's as interested in me as when I finally sit down to write, you know, that's when the phone rings. That's when someone comes to the door. That's when my kids want to tell me about, you know, what they had for lunch and minute detail. But so I went to Italy and this conference, um, it, well, of course, like you can't really go wrong anywhere in Italy, but it was this small, quaint village and um, they had this wonderful guest editor that I got to meet with one on one. This was when I was workshopping my um, young adult thriller and he and I sat and the questions that he asked me just were so thought provoking and they helped me take it in a direction I would never have thought of. And um, that was so hugely beneficial to me. So I, I would say that's probably the best money I've ever spent. I agree. I love writing retreats because you can have a class in the morning and then write all afternoon and not be interrupted, you know, with yes. husbands looking for supper or dogs who need to be taken out to the dog park or anything like that. So it's, it's yeah. really a, a special time when you have that, that time to write. Absolutely. Do you ever Google yourself or read reviews and if so, how do you deal with the bad ones or the good ones? Oh, that, that's a great question. Um, 
I feel like I used to more when, when my young adult thriller came out because that was the first one. I really was looking almost obsessively and, you know, Goodreads uh, for better or worse can be, you know, really quite harsh. Some of the reviews on there really devastating and just uh, so I, I have to say, I kind of stepped back for a while, especially while working on something new and um, a woman in a class that I was taking she got a three book deal and when her first book came out she was deep in the second one and she said she had to stop reading the reviews because it was stopping her from continuing and at the time I thought like oh that's terrible and then I found myself almost in the same boat where it makes you second guess because one person will say like these chapters were too long and then someone else would say these chapters, I I liked the length because I was able to get into it. And so it's almost like these voices in your head that are fighting with each other. And so I've taken um, a big step back from looking, but when I do receive a great one, I mean, it feels like a gift. It's just to think that someone read your words and enjoyed the experience. is just um, like, there's really, I think nothing better than that for a writer as encouragement. What about marketing and publicity? Does your um, publisher provide a publicist? Have you noticed anything that kind of pushes the needle that that works to to help with your sales of the book? Um, You know, I know that they've sent out a lot of advanced reader copies, which has been wonderful. So it's great to just see readers sort of all over the country. You know, somebody in California will have it. And then Um, you know, somebody in New Jersey near me might be reading it. So that's really been interesting to see. And, um, you know, they've done a few Goodreads giveaways, which is exciting to see people adding it to their shelves and to read. And um, they were the ones who secured the Crime Reads um, essay opportunity for me. So I really appreciate that. And then Um, The day after the book comes out, July 12th, the day after I'll be doing a reading um, as part of a panel in Bryant Park in New York with um, a few other authors. And so I'm really excited about that. And they've helped me submit to book festivals, both local and in different parts of the country. So I'm sort of crossing my fingers that those opportunities come through. But in terms of moving the needle, I can't really say I would probably have to ask them, but their marketing team has been just wonderful and so responsive and supportive. So I'm really grateful for all their efforts. And then on my own, I guess, from being a journalist, like I, I don't mind reaching out on my own. So if I see someone who's doing, you know, great work supporting authors, I'll always reach out and offer a copy if I can. So I'm, I'm trying to, to support them as they support me. Well, it's always an interesting challenge because our writers would rather be writing than marketing. <laughs> yes. So it, it becomes um, a catch 22 for us. It does. And I also, I don't know about you, but I feel almost awkward about the self-promotion. I think, you know, we sort of Or the way I grew up, it was kind of like, be modest, don't be talking about yourself. And here it's kind of like, okay, please also, please buy my book. (laughs) It's very difficult for those of us from the South, especially. We were not told to promote ourselves and now we have to get out there and do it. So it's pretty difficult. (laughs) It is, it is. It's kind of, I mean, when other people, when I see other people doing it, I think, oh, you know, good for them. And I'm glad that they told me their book looks interesting. I want to go read it and buy it. And, um, but when it's you, you feel like, oh gosh, these people are probably so sick of me and hearing about this book and it's hard. It is. Well, Liz, our writers over 50 are quite unique. And I just wonder if you have any advice for writers 50 and above. I would just say believe in yourself and believe that there's a reader out there who wants to read your words. And um, I think it's also easy to get discouraged in the age of social media when you see people announcing book deals and announcing that they got an agent. And, you know, many times people will share their backstory of the rejections that they got along the way or the stumbling blocks or how long they've been at it. But for some people, it just seems like 
poof, they got an agent, they got a two book deal or, you know, their book sold at auction. So I would say try to, you know, I think that phrase about there's enough good things to go around or high tide makes all boats rise. There's no, you know, there's no reason to be jealous or feel that, okay, it happened for them. It can't happen for me. I try to look at it as encouragement that, you know, that could be you someday and you just have to kind of stick with it and um, not get discouraged or not think, you know, this is going to take me years to do. It might, but if you just keep heading for that goal, I'm sure you'll achieve it. I think that's great advice for all of us. And we are so happy to chat with you today and wish you you much success in the future. And we're just so happy that you're now one of our authors over 50. Thank you, Julia. I really appreciate your time and support. And uh, it's been wonderful to chat with you. Thank you for joining us today. Please look for Authors Over 50 every Thursday when we will have conversations with accomplished debut novelists over the age of 50. Please subscribe and share with a friend. And check out my own publication journey after 50 at www.juliadaily, that's D-A-I-L-Y, like dailynewspaper.com. Until next time, keep reading and writing. And remember, it's never too late to fulfill a dream in life's sweetest third.